Welcome. Uh, I'm Father Gavin Dunbar, St. John's Church. This is part of an occasional series called Word and Image, looking at some of the works of sacred art in uh, the Christian tradition and uh, some of the things that have brought me great joy and satisfaction, and I hope they'll bring great joy to you also. Uh, one of the first great masterworks in the Italian and Western tradition of painting is an altarpiece called the Maestà by the Sienese painter Duccio, who flourished in the late 13th century, early 14th century. And this uh, altarpiece, uh, which is quite large even now, after some uh, centuries of, uh, of uh, damage, about 13 feet by seven feet, was brought in a great solemn procession to the cathedral in Siena uh, and installed there with great public festivity and rejoicing. And it dominated the view down the nave. Uh, it was here, this is what the front of it looks like today, of course, on a much smaller scale. It's called the Maestà because of course, it's the Virgin and Child enthroned in majesty as King and Queen of Heaven and flanked on either side by saints and angels. And uh, originally, it would have been in a rather complex and richly decorated architectural frame in a Gothic style with lots of pointed gables and pinnacles and so on, making a very striking appearance. Uh, and what added to the, the strikingness of its appearance was the fact that, of course, there's an enormous amount of gold used. Um, uh, real gold, uh, beaten very fine, almost as thin as tissue paper and applied uh, uh, profusely uh, uh, throughout the picture, not only for the halos, but also as backdrop and uh, decorative detail. Uh, the gold, of course, has grown dull with time, but originally must have gleamed with an otherworldly glory in the candlelight of the dimly lit Duomo. So that's the Maya style in the front. And uh, uh, the, the back of the painting, however, is equally remarkable. Uh, the front was open to the general public, to the laity. The back was an area called the choir, reserved for the clergy and for their uh, regular gatherings at the hours of prayer during the day. And on the back, and likewise, it's also lost its uh, richly decorative architectural frame. You can see there's a whole number of much smaller panels, and you may even guess uh, from the central one, uh, you may perceive uh, the crucifixion, this is indeed, uh, uh, it follows the biblical accounts of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. And likewise, there's a great deal of gold. And yet the other color that leaps very much to mind, uh, to the eye rather, is red. And uh, one doesn't have to think very long to realize that red might have a, a symbolic significance in, in, a, in a painting that tells the story of Christ's passion. Well, we're gonna look at a couple of those panels, first in this video and, uh, and another video yet to follow, and uh, look at Duccio's artistry, uh, the artistry he brings to the telling of this story in some detail. So the first panel I want to look at is called the Pact of Judas. Uh, we'll notice, first of all, the element of color. Here, again, reddish tones predominate. Red, peachy red, bluish red, um, brick red, uh, nothing blood red. That's reserved for Christ himself. And yet the predominance of reddish tones somewhat muted by comparison with the blood red uh, that Christ will be wearing, uh, indicates that this is part of the story of our redemption by his blood. Along with the reddish tones, there are, they are set off by some muted green, some muted purplish blue, um, and of course, a lovely blonde uh, uh, tone in the architecture. Duccio is indeed one of the great colorists. He has a delight in color, and it is a sheer joy to look at his pictures simply for their, the, the, the pleasure they give in the wonderful play and variation of color. And yet Duccio has got a story to tell. And the story, of course, is of the Pact of Judas. 
Uh, and here we see that in this huddle of men, we see that Judas has just arrived. You can see his striding gait. He's arrived from the open space over here. And he's this sort of receptive huddle of men is the chief priests and the elders who are glad to hear the news that Judas is ready to betray his master to them and are eager to reward his services by gift of 30 silver coins. And you can see at the very center of the picture, Judas' hands reach out to receive what the high priest is giving him. And you'll notice also the intent gazes of the men as they look at each other um, or look at this transaction, this conspiracy being uh, agreed on uh, between Judas and the high priest. The architecture, however, also helps to tell the story. We have uh, a great interest in sort of exploring architectural space. And uh, though it's relatively shallow space, Duccio doesn't like to have deep plunging perspectives that might distract the eye. Uh, it's a very satisfying, uh, it's a certain dynamic quality here. On this end, on the right, it presses forward as to frame, close the picture frame. Uh, then it steps back with this two bay loggia. And uh, then there's a further recession, which is closed by a tower here. And we get a sense of urban space and that Judas has come out of this opening here on the left and has found a kind of a, uh, reasonably secluded space in which to meet with the elders and the chief priests. But it's really the loggia itself, which is fascinating. Um, you'll know, of course, that at any arch, any vault, uh, it is composed of wedge-shaped stones. And because they're wedge-shaped, they hold each other in place. If we remove one of the stones, the arch collapses. And of course, that's a wonderful image for a conspiracy of the kind that Judas and the high priest have entered into. And in fact, the central arch at the front appears to spring from just behind the high priest's head, and the corresponding central arch at the back springs from the head of Judas. They are indeed the two central pillars in this widespread conspiracy. If the figurative use of arching, arches, and vaulting seems a little far-fetched, I don't think it's a coincidence that there are precisely 10 individuals in this group, and there are 10 visible orange-colored arches in the vault above. We nowadays, we often talk about community as if it's always an unmitigated good. But Tichu knew, as the Christian tradition taught, that there's good communities and bad communities. There's the community united by love of God to the point of contempt for self. And that is the community which Christ founds by his sacrifice. And then there's the community united by love of self to the point of contempt for God. And this is the community made visible to us here. Those are the two choices before us. And in this Holy Week, we pray for grace that we may leave the way of Judas and follow in the way of Christ. Thank you.